So, welcome back. And good morning. My name is Mark Gunzinger. I'm the Director for Future Concepts and Capability Assessments at the Mitchell Institute. So, our first panel is going to focus on the Air Force's power projection capabilities. Now, at the end of the Old War, or the Cold War, which was the Old War, the Air Force released a new vision document that explained why the five characteristics of air power, speed, range, flexibility, precision, and lethality, would continue to underwrite our military's ability to deter and to defend U.S. national interests in a changing world. That vision was called Global Reach, Global Power. So I mention that because we're obviously in another such inflection point in our uh, international environment, but those characteristics remain just as important to our nation's security today as they were 35 years ago. General uh, Alvin is exactly right. The threat environment that we face today is in our wheelhouse, is in the Air Force's wheelhouse. And the ability to project power globally within hours to deter, to achieve air security, to strike targets at times and places of our choosing, no other service can replicate what the Air Force provides our warfighters. So that's why I'm pleased to introduce our panel today for leaders in a, frankly, a never-ending campaign to maintain our nation's asymmetric air power advantage. First, let's welcome Lieutenant General Michael Koshevsky, Commander of the 8th Air Force, pardon me, Deputy Commander of the Air Combat Command. He wishes he was Commander of the 8th Air Force. There you go. I just gave you another star. What are you going to say? Uh, next up, please welcome Major General Jason Armagost, Commander of the 8th Air Force and Joint Global Strike Command. And we're also honored that Doug Young, Sector Vice President and General Manager for Strike, Northrop Grumman Aeronautic Systems, could uh, join us today. Thank you, Doug. And finally, we're very fortunate that Billy Ray Thompson, Director for Air Power Requirements and Capabilities at RTX, could also join our panel. Looking forward to your comments, gentlemen. And of course, I'd also like to thank all of you for attending our inaugural Air Power Futures Forum. So let's uh, get right into a handful of questions before we open it up to questions from the audience. And the first question is for all of our panelists. Now, we know the Air Force is reoptimizing for great power competition. To that, I add great power competition and conflict. Now, this is an enterprise wide endeavor. It's going to require the Air Force to make some tough choices on how it should balance the mix of capabilities in its new force design. So let's start with a question on that mix. The Air Force has said both standoff and stand-in capabilities are important. What's the, the real crux of the matter is what the right balance of those capabilities are. And of course, General Alvin suggested some different language in standoff and stand-in. And that is uh, not just for long-range strikes, it's also for counter air operations, airborne electronic attack, and everything else that we bring to the fight. Again, the key is to establish the right balance. So panelists, would you please offer your thoughts on what that balance might look like in the future? Okay, well, I'm first in line, I guess I'll, I'll start. So um, thanks, Gonzo, for that question. And um, also like to uh, say thanks, General Deptula, for uh, well played hosting a major air power symposium in the Army Navy Club. So the irony, I, <laughs> I appreciate that. So. Um, Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about uh, stand-in, um, standoff forces, and it's good to hear the way you pose the question, where it, it truly is a balanced portfolio, it's a mix. So many times we get in debates and it, we treat it like it's binary or one or zero, which way we're gonna go, and, and really it's, it's, it's the mix. So when we look at stand-in forces, um, even the chief kind of alluded to, almost misnamed in some ways, really we're, we're talking about the, what can operate in that A to AD environment, so penetrating, uh, forces versus non-penetrating would be another um, rubric to look at that from. Um, and on the stand-in side, uh, the right mix, we need to grow our stand-in capability, and we are. Um, a lot of platforms out there, B-21 coming online, uh, incredibly capable airplanes, going to give us incredible power for our nation. Um, and then we look at um, uh, CCAs and some other things that are out there. So we will grow that mix uh, of force. Um, but at the same time, our standoff forces, our general purpose air forces, 
Uh, we have a lot of mission requirements across the globe that will endure that we need to, we're always gonna have a general purpose Air Force. So we're gonna have that, uh, that standoff force that we have to get uh, in the mix as well. And so the way we do that is probably with weapons. Um, and so when we look at the mix and the balance, let's think of some mission areas. So we think about C2, so command and control. Uh, we will have a mix there, both at stand in and stand off. We'll have tactical operations center, uh, fixed, um, medium, and light. We'll be in different ranges uh, within the battle space. Um, and then you think about the other aspects in terms of wing ops centers. So those will be in different parts of the battle space. Um, and then BC, uh, battlefield, the BCC, uh, um, and AOC in terms of distributed capability. So there's a C2 part. Um, and then we think about sensors. Um, clearly, we're using the stand-in part, uh, using a lot of what's uh, currently exists in, uh, in the battle space today, and then stand off, not only in you know the, the Earth's horizon and distance, but also overhead, think space. Um, so kind of a mix of uh, capabilities uh, there as well. But really, the secret sauce, the key to this whole thing is are going to be the networks. It's the integration of the stand-in, stand-off forces that's really going to give us a decisive advantage as a nation. So uh, we, we, we talk a lot about platforms and weapons, and those are very important, and we need to talk about mix and balance. But the network and integration piece is key. And then along those same lines, really that ties into long-range kill chains. And I would offer that getting after long-range kill chains, the nation that has, that achieves effective long-range kill chains, and really misnamed, it's really non-organic long-range kill chains, the ability to huck a weapon in somewhere and then it's finished by something else, somebody somewhere else. Uh, that is really difficult, varsity level stuff, but when we're able to do that at scale, uh, that is that will be a decisive advantage for the, the, the nation that's able to do that first. Um, and it's so important, I would offer that it, it's, our, it's the Manhattan Project of our generation uh, and hopefully we get there first. Thanks. So, uh, I gotta say, first off, that it's, uh, it's a privilege to be here representing the 7,000 people that wake up every morning in uh, Northrop Grumman Aeronautics Strike Division focused on platforms that can deliver effects at long range and do so in non-permissive and areas of denial. So that, that mission focus is really all about our ability to provide options to our warfighters to pace the threat and to be able to execute the missions that uh, I think the chief was alluding to. Our platforms are able to operate across the three mission areas, but of course we focus on the stressing case of the threat that exists in, in mission area one. So when we boil all that down and look back at the inception of the program, uh, namely B-21 in this case, uh, the evolution of requirements uh, going back 10 years was really important in terms of the trade studies we did around affordability, or I should say mass, uh, lethality and access. And affordability was a critical part of that. Uh, it's really baked into the requirements. And that was industry and government coming up with that set of requirements. Embedded in there as well is flexibility. So we'll talk about each of these, but those are really what have been driving our, our focus over the last 10 years and also uh, enabled by a focus on performance in order to deliver those options and do so affordably. So when we're looking at um, Access, clearly uh, being able to operate uh, in those areas of denial, uh, being able to leverage offboard systems in a family of systems concept, context, being able to have flexibility in the payload uh, delivery element. Uh, that flexibility is really built into the requirements as far as how, how we architected uh, the system with open mission system architecture, uh, the way we develop our software in an agile context, and then also being required to have the space weight and power to accommodate new things that enable us to uh, essentially future-proof the platform as time evolves and as we watch this threat come at us. Uh, in terms of affordability, uh, we've had a laser focus on that. We have a requirement to uh, meet a cost target or beat that cost target, and right now we're, we're on track to, to beat that. And it's really all about inculcating the digital uh, foundation that enables us to do our jobs more efficiently and to build flexibility into our ability to adapt as we uh, encounter risks and overcome those risks. We also have focused on moving risk to the left, so tackling the tough problems early so that as we go into production, those problems are behind us. We refer to that as T1 like P1. Essentially, that means the first test aircraft is built just like that first production aircraft. So 
we worked hard to overcome some of the obstacles in building that first aircraft so that when we got to production, we knew where we were going to be on cost and where we were going to be on our schedule commitments. So all that is manifesting uh, quite nicely in the flight test program. We've been uh, flying for over a year now. And uh, every day, the airplane's able to really show us that uh, the design process has played out well. We haven't had a lot of discovery. Uh, we've been able to fly at a, at a very strong rate and are very optimistic about the balance of the test program as we ramp up into production. Okay, I'll go next. Uh, so I, I want to thank uh, Gonzo for uh, leading this forum here uh, in this case, but also Mitchell Institute. This is incredibly invigorating to uh, just to get to talk to people uh, in, in a format like this where uh, we're not about a, a show floor or anything like that. It's about ideas and how we uh, confront uh, the challenges and the opportunities that are presented at a point of inflection. Um, you know, I'll take a, a, a I want to ask even more fundamental questions because I think better questions are more important at inflection points than having strong assertions. And I will take what the chief's slide said, which is uh, to do what? Um, and I would offer that to do what is to deter. And how, so how do we deter with a penetrating and standoff force? I think one of the things that has evolved in my time with the B-21 program through the 5-8 and now essentially as a customer at the 8th Air Force has shown me that we have evolved very rapidly, actually, in our uh, ability to analyze, do analysis, and do net assessment in ways that we were not able to do three years ago. Um, that is actually one of the things I'm most excited about, and that will actually answer that fundamental question more, more completely about penetrating versus standoff. And so having that analysis that can say, here's kind of the sweet spot of what that might look like, because you're trying to do a range of things primarily to deter in competition, in crisis, in conflict, and then the reestablishment of deterrence. And so uh, there's some very interesting data that is kind of played out now over time when it comes to the balance of platforms, weapons, sensors, and now long-range kill chain, but also in the case of penetrating strike, uh, organic kill chain, which remains important and the essential attribute that has to be sustained through um, America's or the world's worst day if, if nuclear conflict or nuclear deterrence ever fails. And so those kind of levels of discussion I think are happening in ways they haven't in the past and I'm very hopeful that we can kind of find that sweet spot through the hard choices we make at a point of inflection. Yeah, so I think uh, first of all, General Detool and Mitchell, thank you so much for being here or allowing us to be here today. Really appreciate it. Um, I think it, you know, at Raytheon we kind of look at this from a uh, weapon standpoint, at least, for you know, everything has to be survivable, interoperable, and mostly probably available. Um, and along those lines, I like the chief's uh, comments on it being a stand-in, stand-off being a continuum here. And that's obviously is how we kind of tend to view things. But I think I'd like to take this just a little bit different direction. So I look out and I see a lot of our partners and allies here in the uh, in the audience. Um, you know, the Air Force has been very clear with us, right, that at the tip of the stand-in fight is often our partners and allies that work to solve a lot of those hard problems of basing and logistics um, that the uh, U.S. will face into the future. So, you know, Ms. Seabold at FIA, you know, she's constantly uh, beating us up, rightfully so, on being on the front side of this and designing for exportability. So I think that'll continue to be really important for uh, folks like us at Raytheon. And then uh, folks like General Heckerl in Europe has been really, you know, uh, adamant about us uh, making sure we're interoperable. And, you know, I think we've seen things like that, you know, with Amram in Ukraine, uh, where, you know, some of those 43 nations with Amram were able to donate, uh, use those missiles in not only the, you know, air-to-air -air role, but in the surface-to-air role. So it's been, uh, that interoperability's really played well there. So I think as, as we at Raytheon look at this again, trying to make things survivable, interoperable, and available, but uh, really also thinking about how our partners and theater uh, commanders will use that. Oh, yeah, thank you. There's some excellent uh, uh, thoughts there. I really like the part about uh, organic versus inorganic kill chains. Uh, when you talk about a balance mix, it's more than just stand in and stand off, of course. It's also establishing the right balance between our ability to close kill chains organically and inorganically, and the effects they can create are, can be very different. So let's move to our, uh, our second question. Uh, over the last 30 years, I think we're all aware that we've become accustomed to having the advantage of air security, 
in operations against lesser regional adversaries. And today we cannot assume that air superiority and appear conflict be a given. We know it will not, but we must assume it will remain a core responsibility for the Air Force. Why? Because no other force provider can give that to a joint force operations, can provide the degree of air superiority needed for joint force operations to succeed. So this question is where uh, Coach and Billy Ray, what are your thoughts on the system of systems the Air Force will need in the future to perform that core mission? Okay. Um, I'll start on that. So you're, you're, Gonzo, you're exactly right. The, um, air superiority is a prerequisite for joint force success. That's just a fact. Um, and we're the service with responsibility to do that. But what I'll say is the days of, I think, desert storm, of that we're just going to wipe the skies clean of adversary air and that we're going to drill down on enemy air defenses and set the condition then just for complete and utter dominance and tempo, you know, the place and time of our choosing, that's probably, we're not talking about that anymore, the high end fight. So what we're talking about is creating episodic, temporary um, air superiority, pockets of air superiority, or things that enable operations or strikes that we're trying to do um, to, to basically achieve an effect. Um, so that is undeniable that we have to do that. We, are, we, we think about that every day at Air Combat Command. Um, the challenge is what, right, what mix, um, how do we do that, and how do we do that in an affordable, thinking about affordability, I think the Mitchell Institute likes to use cost effectiveness, so that's probably a better way to say it. And so um, one approach to that is we look at the NGAD family of systems and we think in terms of um, CCA, collaborative combat aircraft. Uh, we really see that as an opportunity um, to advance air superiority initiatives and capability in an affordable way for the nation. And the reason is um, the, the, the way these things will be operated with being uncrewed aircraft they won't have to fly at the periodicity of, say, our manned fighters. Um, but at the same time, they'll be integrated uh, as, a, as teams with uh, crewed aircraft. And so we see the best of both worlds. Um, and we look at the technologies out there in terms of AI, um, artificial intelligence, um, and what we can do with collaborative combat aircraft. As we train in the joint synthetic environment and learn, we'll be able to actually, the whole fleet of, of CCAs will be able to learn and get better. And then, of course, we get affordable mass is what we're really getting out of that. When you look at a man fighter or a quarterback uh, being able to control multiple CCAs, um, we see a lot of potential and a very good price point uh, in the future. Thanks. Yeah, I think um, your episodic comment, right, you know, that air superiority can be, has to be episodic now is certainly a, certainly a true statement, right? It seems like the conversation around air superiority has changed a lot over the last 30 years, and it somewhat looks and feels a little different, you know, from the big blue sky, uh, air superiority down to now what we're seeing, you know, they surfaced a 3,000 foot small UAS air superiority, and how are we going to provide that? Um, and we at Raytheon, of course, you know, we want to be able to provide that range of capabilities, right? Whether we're talking about kinetic effectors, non-kinetic effectors, or anything else, in order to provide that you know, joint force, you know, commander, um, the ability to prosecute that episodic piece of air priority wherever they need it. Um, I think what we focus on doing right is trying to provide some operational flexibility. Um, in that, you know, we don't ever want to hand over to the warfighters, you know, a tool. You know, we want to hand over a set of tools that's going to allow you guys to be able to operate from that surface up to 30,000, whether it's the air component commander or the land component commander for things like air base air defense, depending upon where that mission ends up. But uh, so that's, I think, how we want to focus on this. You know, as a company, we want to, whether it's kinetic or non-kinetic effectors, you know, the sensors, the whole piece, we want to be able to provide capabilities that can operate, you know, on the kind of same common operational picture that's going to allow you know, those really smart folks to utilize the proper tool at the proper time to provide that episodic air superiority that you guys need. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to offer maybe a slightly uh, expansive view of air superiority um, uh, in an anti-access area of the Nile environment. Um, so I had the luxury, uh, you never know where it's going to end up, uh, but I had the luxury of starting as a young lieutenant uh, being a wingman for then Captain uh, Kevin Schneider uh, as he was getting his weapons school spin up uh, before he left Misawa Air Force Base, uh, or Air Base in Japan. 
and uh, uh, then Colonel uh, Nordo North was our ops group commander. And it was a very, it was an inflection point that I didn't realize at the time uh, with regards to, we had bl brand new Block 50 F-16 CJs. And what I saw people figure out in that environment about how a kill chain or is attacked, how a kill chain is operated through, whether it comes to air superiority in an air-to-air -air aspect or in uh, uh, suppression of enemy air defense, because those are interlocked, interlinking environments, uh, becomes critical. And I think, uh, um, uh, having had that approach, it's it, the, the kill web as it has become endemic to the anti-access area denial piece uh, is something that we have to figure out how we disaggregate that from inside. And it becomes not about specific roles and missions, it becomes operating through that environment. Thank you. I'm glad uh, the topic of CCA uh, came up. I'm going to touch on that uh, in just a moment here. Uh, but let's drill down a little bit into long-range strikes. Like air security, our Air Force must organize, train, and equip to conduct long-range strikes in uh, well, all threat environments, not just the highly contested. And the Air Force's approach for maintaining its long-range strike advantage is centered on fielding a family of systems, or systems of systems, if you will, like the B-21, B-52, and the weapons they carry, as well as enablers like the NGAP. So this is kind of a two-parter for uh, Armo and Doug, if you would. First, is this family of systems approach still the right way for the Air Force to go? Because it has been under pressure, primarily due to budget limitations. And second, what roles might uncrewed systems like uh, CCA contribute to long-range strike operations as part of that family of systems? Sure. Um, <clears throat> so the, uh, the B-21 and the other programs that we're focused on in Northrop, uh, family of systems has really been a concept that's been uh, involved from the, the outset, certainly in the B-21 period and, until the present which is uh, designing in the ability to connect with other things and to benefit from offboard sources of information, to work in a collaborative fashion with other platforms, but also to be a node that pushes out the requisite information for these other platforms to take advantage of. So if you consider a CCA that's out there for sensing ability or for actually delivering weapons or both, assuming it's at a similar level of survivability, you can accompany airplanes like the B-21 out there in the wild, if you will, and benefit from sharing information that makes the overall force more effective. So think in terms of one plus one equals three, that's been the principle by which we have looked at the architecture and really baked in from the beginning the ability to interface with these other multiple systems and also to be able to quickly revise and optimize in a way to adapt because the threat is gonna continue, continue to move. And I don't really think that a family of systems concept necessarily has to be considered a cost, uh, uh, a cost problem to overcome in that there are a lot of existing systems and the matter of connecting them is not a big cost driver. In many cases, it's not technical. It's actually people and policy. And so, so how we get those information streams to the platforms quickly, provided they have comms and, and uh, other capabilities to ingest those, it's really about connecting those things. And a lot of good work's really starting to happen now that many of these systems are out operating. V2 in particular, uh, a lot of modernization work that we've done over the last 10 years and are moving more into is the ability to be able to adapt and tie into those networks and take advantage of those off-board capabilities. I think in, in terms of uh, an organic kill chain and the resiliency of that organic kill, kill chain is the build out through a larger set of operations. So the, so the short answer to the question is yes, um, but then um, the system of systems being uh, a relevant and important approach. But within that, like the Mitchell Institute and I think you, Gonzo in particular, have done great work on uh, holding fixed and or mobile targets at risk and the balance of that in the type of threat environment that you're facing. And the ability to hold fixed targets at risk is a relatively simple problem um, from, a, from a targeting standpoint, not necessarily from an access to the target space or effects standpoint. But the mobile piece is very interesting for that because that's when you get back to your organic kill chains linked subsequently to a long range kill chain where you can now hold at risk mobile targets or mobile target complex uh, and have custody of targets in ways 
that is very meaningful uh, for that environment. Yeah, if I could just add one thing to all that. When we talk about family of systems, really the blue kill chain and the red kill chain, the, the family of systems uh, is a big enabler to be able to execute those kill chains because you have more data sources and connectivity, but then also to deny and disrupt the red kill chain because that's not all going to be done by one particular node in the system. That's going to be a system level issue that's going to, to enable uh, breaking down those kill chains to create ambiguity in each step of the kill chain. So that's really what it's all about once you're deep in there and trying to solve that problem. I'd like to um, agree with you, gentlemen, I complete on the uh, comment you made regarding the B21 was founded on the concept of family systems. And I, I agree, it, it does remain a valid concept. In fact, uh, I'll point out uh, uh, retired Major General Charlie Lyon in the back who uh, helped lead the uh, LRSB uh, study uh, who conceived of that concept. And I, I think it remains just as valid today as in the future. Armo, you drill down a little bit more into the unique um, capabilities that uh, our force has provided when we are able to conduct penetrating strikes, conduct strategic attacks into an adversary's homeland to deny them sanctuary, just as they're attempting to deny us sanctuary, say, in the first and second island chain? Yeah, I'll give you a, a kind of a, a speculative example and then a, then a recent historical example. Um, so, um, yeah, it goes back to the, the question of deterrence, right? If you cannot hold a target at risk, you cannot deter. And, and there are many reasons with which you could not hold a target at risk, um, but primarily uh, assured access and credibility to use those forces in that environment is uh, something that needs to be planned and thought through and uh, developed through a systems approach and then analyzed as you go with the, with the modularity or the ability to insert new tech as it comes, which again, the B-21 has been engineered very marvelously to do, um, okay? And so the recent example would be, I think it was probably two or three weekends ago, I literally lose track of time and days, but within uh, a 48 hour period, there were three press releases with OSDPA, uh, UCOM, and then CENTCOM with bomber activities taking place literally around the globe. And I'm sorry, Indopaycom as well, USFK because we were simultaneously, and if this is important, simultaneously uh, sending B-1s on a trilateral uh, mission in response to Indo-PACOM in response to the ICBM launch by North Korea. Simultaneously sending a uh, uh, planned bomber task force mission to uh, UCOM at Fairford. Um, literally, in, in some cases, uh, jets were airborne going three different directions at one time. Uh, we were simultaneously, uh, CENTCOM released that you know, B-52s were going to LUD. And then this was on the heels, immediately on the heels of the Yemen strike by the B-2s uh, a few days before that. And so that ability to do that uh, is not accidental. Uh, it's, it's a rigorous process. It is, uh, to be rigorous, it needs to be responsive. Um, but this, at the same time, uh, the future operating environment is going to, I suspect, demand the same kind of traits and attributes and characteristics that allow us, allowed us to pull that off in this uh, most recent example. Thank you. So every optimized force design must also have a munitions inventory that is sized and shaped for great power conflict. And we know that DOD, not just the Air Force, uh, has a significant shortfall and PGMs, preferred munitions, both uh, uh, short range, long range, uh, uh, direct attack, so forth. So for all panelists, if you, if you like, uh, could you comment on um, what you think a future munitions inventory for the Air Force might look like? Uh, uh, the right balance between their ranges, uh, their payloads, and certainly their survivability, and perhaps touch on cost effectiveness as well, which I kind of prefer uh, to the term affordable mass. Yeah, Gonzo, I'll, I'll start with that one. So um, when we look at our weapons portfolio, think in terms of capability and capacity. Um, so prioritize weapons as we look at them, air-to-air, -air, um, counter maritime, long-range kill chain, seed, um, and then I'll say we call it affordable mass, but cost-effective weapons um, would be the fifth point. So in terms of capability, uh, 
we're doing pretty good. Um, we look at uh, air to air capability in the future. Um, we look at um, some counter maritime. Uh, but the problem is they're expensive and we don't have a lot of these weapons. Um, we're getting after, you know, enhancing F 35 capabilities with a stand and attack weapon, a joint strike missile. But so capability, um, we're there, but what about the c capacity part? And that's where we're looking at things like Franklin, so, um, which is a, an affordable mass capability where, say, instead of a, a $1.5 million JASM, we have about a $100,000 weapon that can go uh, about 500 miles and can punch a hole in a ship. And so it doesn't decisively have to do that, but uh, the captain has got to be threatened and honor those weapons because now that mass will make our higher end weapons more effective and more capable. Um, so those are the, a, a lot of the concepts that we're, uh, we're looking at for our uh, weapons portfolio capability. Go ahead. Um, so in the weapons area, payload, uh, you know, we think about the B-21 and we talk about it as a sixth generation platform. And so you know, what does that mean? It just really says that we've taken survivability to a whole new level. Uh, we have uh, created a system that can operate with these capabilities as a daily flyer. So it's really leveraging the, the supportability needs to be able to operate uh, on that daily basis. But most importantly, relative to munitions, is that that flexibility and adaptability that I keep coming back to. And so in the architecture, the open mission system architecture, the standards that were used, we have the ability to adapt very rapidly to new mission loadouts and to carry diverse loadouts and look at the fact that the aircraft is designed for a nuclear and, and conventional mission. So that range is, is well in, uh, in, in, enveloped, if you will, in what we architected for. At the same time, uh, the Air Force is going through a, a complete redo, really, of what kind of weapons are out there. Most of the weapons that we've been talking about in previous years were you know, developed in the 90s. And there's really a generation that's coming online of new weapons many of them tailored for exactly the kind of missions that we're talking about in terms of operating in anti-access air denial areas and really uh, uh, doing new things, unique things, in order to deal with the red kill chain and other aspects of, of what we face when we go into that threat environment. Okay, I'll offer uh, an example and then uh, maybe point at, uh, again, the ops and analysis piece. So, I don't know, probably 25 years ago, maybe a little less, the B-2 was uh, looking to either onboard an SDB or a 500-pound JDAM. And the difference in number, in mass, if you will, uh, was 240 SDB in two weapons bays of the B-2 or 80 500-pound JDAM. And we opted for that more affordable second choice, which is the 80 500-pound JDAM. Uh, and I would also argue that that was, that was probably the right choice at the time because it became a mission management problem for 240 weapons off of a single airplane, potentially in one pass. It becomes, you overwhelm the, anal or the computer's of processor's ability at that point. And so, uh, so that, I think, is a good representation of some, some choices that were made uh, that would represent um, faster, uh, more comprehensive, better cost effectiveness. Um, but then looking forward, again, the, the analysis and net assessment piece that I think we've kind of evolved on very rapidly and effectively to make better choices, be prepared to make better choices, is really playing out, I think, in the munitions piece. Um, uh, and again, at an inflection point where we can make very deliberate choices about what, what mass means and what it means across mission sets and roles going forward. Yeah, I think a couple thoughts along those lines. Um, one thought being, you know, probably the fastest way or, you know, one of the easier ways to get after that cost-effectiveness solution you're talking about is uh, upgrading existing capabilities, right? You know, they're already in production, they're in inventory, they're integrated, uh, the warfighters are trained in them, so maybe that allows us to get at that cost-effectiveness up front on that side of the curve. And then on the other side of the curve being, you know, as platform agnostic as we can possibly be, everything from you know B-21s to CCAs and everything, everything uh, else. Um, you know, weapons like uh, Stormbreaker, to your point, you know, SDB-2, net enabled, you know, so it helps with that problem of what are you going to do when 280 of them are out there. Multi-effects warhead, tri-mode seeker, you know, and then just that smaller form fit factor that will allow for uh, you know, for a, a lot of them, you know, just to get after that problem. So, you know, it's something we certainly look at every day, again, trying to provide that range capabilities, being agnostic of the platform for the most part. 
Yeah, I've always been a big fan of uh, trying to figure out how we could extend the operational lives of current generation missions by winging them or putting a cheap power plant on and extend their range to make the platform launching them more survival and so forth. Uh, we, we really uh, like to talk about fifth gen, sixth gen, and uh, why that is the core of our future force. But the fact of the matter is about 70% of the Air Force today is still fourth gen or earlier fighters and bombers. So this is for uh, Coach Armo and Billy Ray, if you care to ring in. Uh, what is the potential for a new generation of long range weapons to get our fourth gen capabilities back into the fight for air superiority, just as a, for instance, uh, in, a, in a peer conflict, obviously. And uh, do you also see a counter role, a uh, counter air role for the Air Force's bombers, uh, possibly including uh, uh, long range air to air uh, kill chains against high value adversary aircraft? I'll take the, uh, some of the fighter piece to that. So Gonzo, you're exactly right. The majority of our force is um, fourth gen, so between our F-16s, um, most numerous fighter and F-15s, and we're going to have um, fortune capability for years to come. So one thing I'll say is the general air per, air, or general purpose Air Force, what it does is it enables our penetrating capability to focus on the high end fight, and so they're paying bills um, that higher level, more expensive assets don't have to pay. So things like defensive counter air, we're always going to have to pay defensive counter air bills. Um, homeland defense, uh, we're looking at absent requirements, and you can see what's going on over there currently. And those, you know, we're going to live with that for years to come. So they have a very key and important part in our portfolio today, and will so in the future, just from that aspect of it. But now the question is bringing them more into the high end fight, and we're already doing that. When you look at things like JASM, uh, F 15s and F 16s carry JASM. So um, with that standoff capability, we once we get networked and we talked about in a previous question integrating this force uh, with non-organic long-range kill chains. Um, that'll be more and more relevant, and so I think that'll be part of our portfolio for years to come. And then as you look at things like bringing on the F-15 um, EX, um, you know, Comac was down at um, Eglin the other day and had power on the jet, and you know he's looking at on the scope at air pictures on the other side of the world. Um, you know that's what we're talking about, really game-changing um, capability. Um, as we still leverage what we have in terms of capability on the fourth gen side of the house. All right, I'll, uh, uh, because it's a futures forum, I keep having to talk about history and because of, uh, you know, how we classify sources and things like that. But, but we act like this question um, is new, and I don't think it is new. Uh, counter air has always been a part of bomber history. Um, in World War II, for example, uh, a German fighter pilot who was captured was asked, what it was like, and this was prior to P-51 being in the, in the mix, asked what it was like to attack one of those large bomber formations uh, with a fighter, and he said it was like trying to make love to a porcupine on fire. That, and, and that's a quote. So I think counter air uh, has been um, a part of that DNA. So the, the fact that it, it, it gets brought up as a question uh, of, of expanding our minds and roles and missions uh, across platforms uh, is I think unfortunate uh, because um, clearly there's a mission set out there with, based on long range kill chain in particular, but there are also opportunities for a penetrating force to do very interesting things with appropriately sized modular weapons that could do uh, very different things from uh, what we've historically bound them to. I agree with both of you. You know, I think it was uh, actually General Harris at a recent uh, conversation with General Deptuli where he talked about the mix of 6th gen and 4th gen and um, the bottom line being, yes, we're going to need that. Um, so that mix between exquisite weapons, you know, maybe coming off of 4th gen or maybe some not so exquisite weapons coming off of, uh, you know, our, our newest technology out there. Uh, I think there's going to be a place for that, right? Is that as we look across continuum of of a conflict, you know, every day is not going to be day one. Every day is not going to be day 100, and they're going to look different throughout that throughout that time period. So that mix will certainly be important, I think, as we go forward and, and try to figure out how to do that. But you know, we certainly, uh, again, being platform agnostic as we can be, certainly see a role for um, long range weaponry off of non traditional assets, whether they're bombers or you know, cargo aircraft or whatever, um, you know, again, that prefix of what's in front of the 21 or, or 17 or whatever you want to call it, it's really uh, doesn't matter, right? As long as that, that system platform can operate within the system of systems and be able to 
you know, identify, you know, target, track, and then eventually uh, close that kill chain that Coach mentioned earlier. Um, I certainly see an opportunity for that. I just want to add one vignette too, relative to the fourth gen comment. Um, in the case of B2, we've been working to keep that relevant over the last 30 years with a couple of generations of, of improvements. And most recently, in the context of this discussion, uh, we did a display upgrade that allowed us to segregate the flight software from the mission software, which then enabled us to more rapidly adapt and upgrade B2, which includes our ability to better uh, interface with weapons in a similar way that B21 will be able to. So I think as providers, you know, we owe that optionality to, to the, the government to be able to adapt with existing systems as well to maintain their relevance uh, going forward. And that was one of the uh, areas that team creatively did, leveraging actually the same software environment we had created on B21 back to the B2 so that we had that agile uh, flexibility. Excellent, so two more questions and we'll open it up to the audience. Well, let's, let's talk about deterrence a little bit more. So multiple studies have said that uh, our bomber inventory is frankly far too small to meet operational demands in this era of great power competition and conflict. Uh, but the acquisition rate of the B-21 is frankly just as important as the future size of our bomber force. And, and the acquisition rates of immediate concern uh, this decade when the threat of a Chinese aggression may, may be greatest. So for Armo and Doug, what are your thoughts on the need and the potential from an industrial based perspective uh, to increase the bomber, uh, bomber's inventory, uh, the size of it as, as quickly as possible to enhance deterrence, both conventional and nuclear deterrence? You want to start? So uh, it was hinted at earlier, we can do different things with what we have, and then we can also uh, uh, decide on a different future potentially too. So um, doing different things with what we have, that was a great example that you just gave, Doug, about uh, isolating that, that, that mission system software from the OFP for the, for the aircraft, so you now have airworthiness issues that are not constantly driving the timeline for software integration and weapons integration and things like that. And so, I think that's that's really important, but I, I would also offer that uh, the, some of the best thinking I found on this actually was done by the Strategic Posture Commission report mm. out of the 22 NDAA, uh, and there's a fantastic report that is bipartisan, that is uh, uh, assessed in an unclass environment around the future threat, uh, with the current uh, force being the context for all of those discussions. And I think there's some very good thinking that was done, again, uh, agnostic of the politics behind the bipartisanship of the commission. Um, and it's very useful to me to think about, you know, the various possible futures we could have for our long range strategic forces in the spirit of deterrence. Yeah, I, I guess I would add, um, you know, everyone, it's, it's well acknowledged out there that there's sort of this bomber uh, bathtub and all this where, you know, some of the bombers are phasing out and B-21's coming online. So. You know, certainly we're mindful of the demand function that's out there and, and are watching closely as the Air Force does its studies, uh, force structure studies. But at the end of the day, our job every day is to go out and perform. So that's what we are focused on. We are focused on performing and delivering this capability, getting the risks behind us so the options are out there for the, uh, the, the uh, country to, to ramp up if that's what's required. So it's really about performance and optionality uh, to enable those decisions that are in front of us. Yeah, and I mentioned uh, nuclear deterrence. Uh, our current uh, triad is sized to deter one uh, nuclear peer adversary, and we now know that we have two nuclear peer adversaries. So again, one of the uh, most cost-effective ways potentially to increase the capacity of our triad would be a dual capable bomber. So let's get into a really easy question on uh, uh, defending our theater bases forward. Uh, we know from what General Alvin has said, what we've read, and uh, from our own experience, that our forward bases remain very vulnerable to missile attack, not just ballistic missiles, but uh, cruise missiles as well. Uh, Coach, what must be done to ensure that the Air Force can continue to fight with and alongside our allies forward? Uh, what do we need to do as airmen to defend and to fight our air bases? Uh, some of the operating concepts beyond ace and, and specific capabilities. 
Okay, thanks, Gonzo. Yeah, and you hit, you know, in the interim, what we're doing, the Agile Combat Employment Piece, both proactive and reactive, where you have a main operating base and four operating stations and you move between. So CC and D and things like that to go with it. That's what we're doing right now. But now on the more um, air base, air defense perspective, or point defense, um, looking at it. Um, well, in CENTCOM and AFSTAN, we're doing that already, and I think we're doing that by focusing on the C2 part from the Air Force's perspective. Um, and so, in CENTCOM, basically at our bases, we have combined joint operations centers, formerly known as wing operations centers, and that's where whoever's on base, where it's coalition, partners, allies, joint forces, we all get together and we integrate our capabilities to defend the base. And that's all the way from counter small UAS all the way up um, to ballistic missile and then some of the even more difficult challenges of um, cruise missile uh, and hypersonic missiles. So um, as we work at the C2 problems and try to defend our bases there, that I think that's going to help inform the future when we look at the high-end fight. So when you think in terms of the indo pacom scenario, uh, Secretary Kendall, I think just recently in Texas at the uh, airlift and tanker uh, symposium said that he, he posed that, hey, the Air Force uh, relies on the Army to do this, but he's willing to take a look at what the Air Force can do in terms of defending our bases uh, organically. And of course, he caveated that and said with the resources, money, and people uh, to do that. So um, it's, it's an imperative. I think it's something we have to look at and, and try to get after um, while the um, ACE is, it helps, um, it's necessary, but it's not sufficient. And so we're going to have to improve our capability to defend our air bases. Absolutely, it is an imperative. Uh, couldn't agree with you more. And that may be a role the Air Force uh, might need to take on in the future, but also imperative. It cannot rob Peter to pay Paul for that mission. It will need yeah. additional resources, including people, yes. not just the dollars to do that. Okay, so we do have time for one more wrap up question. Uh, before we open to audience questions. Uh, General Alvin said, next-gen technologies could really reshape how we organize, train, and equip for uh, our uh, operations in the future, how we conduct power projection operations in various threat environments. So what are your thoughts, panel, on the potential for some technologies like hypersonic weapons, directed energy, uh, autonomous systems to really be power projection game changers. You don't have to limit it to those technologies. That's just for example. Where should the Air Force, DOD for that matter, really focus their s and investments? Um, well, I'll tell you what, I think uh, you, you know, we'll start with hypersonics, right? You know, hypersonics, it's an attribute, right? It's an attribute of an effect. And I think, you know, the real key to hypersonics being, you know, it's the ability to hold targets at depth at risk. So certainly, I think that's something that we'll continue to invest in. I think it's something DOD should uh, continue to take a look at. Um, directed energy, um, as we talk about air base air defense, certainly we we always talk about it, uh, directed energy from the defensive standpoint. Um, you know, right now with the technology, sometimes taking a larger power source, um, you know, it tends to be a fixed site, things along those lines. But I think something we need to take a look at right is the offensive use of directed energy and how do we make those power sources smaller um, and mobile and be able to, you know, within the constraints of law of armed conflict and the ROE and the theater and things along those lines, look at offensive uh, directed energy. And then, you know, we talked a little bit about it again, uh, wow. UASs, I'd say taking the, uh, taking the things that they do best that, you know, getting that warfighter, I'm sorry, the uh, actual crewman, crewwoman out of the loop, you know, so the extended range, the ability to switch, you know, sensors and effectors and all those things with UASs and the CCA piece would be a pretty important move forward and certainly something we want to continue to take a look at. I feel like I'm about to steal Doug's answer, but that's okay, I'll go anyway. Uh, so I think actually there's an attribute of uh, not just the B-21, but uh, long, range for long range strike forces in general and then um, you know, inside of Mighty Eight, we have uh, D4B as well. So I have large platforms with large power sources with generally fairly large crews that are pretty adaptable inherently with, with those uh, kinds of traits. And so the modularity piece is actually what I would offer a, is maybe the critical place for new tech, for tech insertion to land. Um, and, and the modularity as it applies to different platforms, not just inside of uh, bombers and, for example, E4B for command and control, national level command and control. 
But um, the modularity piece is essential, and General Alden actually talked about you know government reference architecture, um, uh, UAI, things like that that really make that possible. Because otherwise, in isolation, uh, the tech base could develop things that are uh, extremely important, but uh, don't have a great place to land. And so I would offer that that's kind of the trait we as a service ought to be aiming towards. Excellent. Yeah, I guess the one I would add is uh, if the government wanted to continue to focus their investments on really studying the threat base that's out there that's, that's basically uh, being gathered every day and really start to align some of the technologies and effects against the fact that we know that our adversaries are more networked, that we know they're using more digital capabilities. So how do we stay inside that loop relative to unique technologies to deliver effects that we can then ingest onto our platforms that have the standards and the, and the capability to ingest those? So with that flexibility, again, we want to come back to getting new things on rapidly to future-proof the platforms we're putting out there as that threat evolves. So focusing that aspect of the tech base. Um, I think some game changers that are relatively near term that we need to just go after, uh, double down on, is the CCA and then inorganic long range kill chains. Um, and the reason is we get we get after the mass problem that we're struggling with right now. And then the as we learn with these capabilities, our captains and majors are going to go out there and come up with ways, innovative ways to do this. And the complexities and the problems we can create for our adversaries with that force is just it's. The deterrent value of that is very, very significant. Excellent. Thank you very much, panel, for your, uh, your excellent thoughts. Much appreciated. Uh, we're going to take a few questions from the audience. So here's the deal. Raise your hand. Uh, someone will come around to you with a microphone. Uh, identify yourself and, uh, and ask your question, if you will, and your affiliation. Yes. So the question I have is, you know, when you think and, and about... Identify yourself, please. Hi, I'm Chris Baker with IBM. Right. Um, you know, when you think about 1940 to 1945, America produced over 300,000 jets. And the capabilities we have today, the chips, the technologies that go into it, is it more the capability or are numbers going to be a factor in the future? So I would never want to critique the chief slides, but I'll offer one change I might make from a from a operational uh, perspective on uh, the, the imperative for speed, which I completely agree with. But I would add a dimension to that, which is tempo. And tempo matters actually, in my mind, more uh, because tempo will equate to mass. It will equ equate to the ability to contest denied space to uh, put weapons effects on targets across domain. And so there is a balance, and again, I would offer back to the analysis and net assessment piece that we are kind of seeing the path to that, in my opinion, um, about the choices that are available to us to, to, to get at some kind of a tempo that is relevant. And again, in Gonzo, I would, I would say that if you want to reference a, another source for interesting thoughts on that, I would reference your B21 uh, slides and paper from earlier this year that kind of very clearly pointed that with, with that shows kind of the required weapons effects over time and that's so it's speed over time is what I would offer okay next question yes sir hey Bill Bill Sweetman uh, with uh, Valkyrie Strategic Solutions I'm um, just building on that point about tempo um, is any consideration being given, as we look out to the far future, to uh, long-range systems that uh, uh, are considerably faster than the mostly subsonic aircraft we have now, um, because those could potentially increase sortie rate at range by, uh, quite dramatically? So I just wonder if any, anything is being considered to look at platforms like that. Thanks. Well, I know we are. We're looking at that um, uh, for the distant future, not the near future, I would say, um, because there's some very interesting things that happen. If you can combine, you know, uh, historically, I would uh, I would say that uh, the effects of stealth were attributed with speed in the past. I, you know, if you look in the 60s and 70s, it was a race to see who could go the fastest. 
uh, with the most, and, and you know, like the XB70 is a good example. Um, and so if you can contribute or you can, you can uh, kind of wed those technical capabilities of stealth with speed, it is, that's yet another potential game changer. And so the th those are things we're looking at. And then you also, to your point about tempo and sortie count and ability to respond very quickly from very large distances, uh, uh, that's something we're considering. But again, that's, that's from our perspective um, in, the, in the distant future or near distant future. Yeah, and I think I would add from a munition standpoint, you know, we're obviously always looking at, you know, how far can you make something go and how much faster can you make it get there. And we're always fighting against that, what has been the historical tendency, right, of the farther you want to go, the faster you want to go, the more expensive it's going to be, right? And that goes against, you know, cost-effectiveness discussion that you, that you've uh, been leading here, Gonzo. And so, you know, we're very involved in that right now, you know, because we, we've been hearing what you guys have been saying for a while. And as we look at how we get, you know, help with the mass problem, but still make things go farther and faster, it's certainly something that you know we're remaining pretty engaged on. Actually, an interesting question when you lay it up against uh, the deterrence discussion, and uh, you look at the three legs of the triad and consider the air leg. One of the good things about the air leg is that it doesn't happen instantaneously. That it's something that can be a build up. It can something that can establish a presence when tensions are high. We talk about the bomber task force. Uh, if something's hypersonic, once it's launched, it's pretty much going to be there pretty quick. So there is also an aspect of overall strategy that might relate to a different uh, speed of delivery uh, in a lot of critical mission uh, and deterrent uh, contexts. Okay, other questions? Yes, sir. In the corner. Uh, Dino Murray from Stellar Solutions. We uh, talked a little bit about the importance of allied long-range strike and integrating that. How about the rest of the joint force? How are we doing and how the other services are building long-range strike and particularly how are we thinking about the future of what uh, uh, space fires may look like? Great question. So I, I, that's a great question. I think uh, um, in my mind, that comes together uh, historically in my experience as the 5.8 for Global Strike Command. That really, that discussion was driven through the munitions piece and, and how do we, uh, across the service, and OSD had a, a focus area on munitions for this very reason, that um, you know, we, ought to, we ought to not just be cost efficient in the Air Force, we ought to be cost efficient across our mission portfolios. Uh, in the joint force, and there are very interesting and good ways to do that by capitalizing on R&D and fielded systems that could be maybe modified slightly to go faster to, uh, you know, be available for a modular inject. And so, uh, in my mind, that kind of comes together through the munitions portfolio, but also then, uh, I think it would, I would offer that the long-range kill chain piece um, can really drive us to better outcomes on that as well. Okay, I'll offer a thought there. Uh, I think all the services, frankly, are chasing long-range strike capabilities, capabilities that only our Air Force can provide at scale, at range, and, and with precision. Uh, that's why I've been an advocate for some real cost-effective analyses of uh, the kinds of investments our services are making in long-range strike to make sure we're optimizing that capability area for department as a whole, not just for every service. Other questions? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Hi, good morning. Sarah Davidson, O2X uh, Human Performance. So, in terms of power projection, what does investing in the human weapon system or upgrading the human weapon system look like to you? So, I'll hit some of that because um, we're already. We call it, uh, we have a lot of different programs, human performance optimization, optimizing the human weapon system. And so, um, but a lot of those are, are um, kind of ad hoc programs. Um, and so we're focused on a lot of the uh, stress and strains of um, long endurance sorties. And it seems like as we pile on more equipment, we just keep piling on the helmets. And I have asymmetric helmets and problems with necks. Um, our ejection seats to survive an ejection weren't designed for comfort. And just all these things, it's really um, hard on the, the human body. So we're chart starting to treat our um, 
airmen and our warriors more like professional athletes and getting after preventative care. And so if you, a lot of our Air Combat Command bases, we have OHWS programs where you have trainers, uh, weightlifting, and then we have um, physical therapy. Um, and I just, I think as we look at these long endurance and long sorties, we're just gonna have to do more and more of that. And we're seeing already value in that because we're seeing a higher um, air crew and pilot readiness rates based on this preventative care. Yeah, I would offer uh, the recent Yemen strikes for the B-2, without getting into the operational details of it, uh, were record-breaking as far as uh, the human performance aspects of that. Um, and so um, that is inherent to the business that we do, um, and it is the first question out of my mind as an operational commander is, you know, the, the readiness of the crew force to conduct those kind of things. And so uh, in partnership with ACC, I know that there's some great work being done uh, that really kind of get us at an optimization of the human piece of the weapon system um, uh, because it, it, it seems to, ha the trend has been that they're getting longer and more uh, detailed and uh, the physical challenges of conducting those missions is pretty epic. Okay, so we are just about at the end of our panel. Uh, I'd like to thank our panelists for sharing their thoughts, the candid thoughts with us uh, today. Uh, administrations come, administrations go, and the international environment is always changing. But I'll reiterate something I said at the beginning. Speed, range, flexibility, precision, lethality. I'll add air power is inherently offensive. Uh, those are immutable principles, the foundation of what we must do to ensure our nation's uh, security, and that's the uh, Air Force. So please uh, thank all of our panelists. Quick round of applause. And we'd uh, respectfully like to ask you to take about a five minute uh, uh, short break in place while we set up for our next panel. Thank you.